This is part 23 of a series of videos about parametric curves, and it's really the second part of a sub-series about modeling the trajectory of a ball as it moves through the air. Anything that moves through the air also is commonly called a projectile, but I will typically refer to it as a ball. We've been emphasizing some calculus facts without really worrying about or getting into the details about why the calculus facts, facts work. In parts 0 through 21, I did try to motivate these facts and why they make sense in the case of motion along a straight line, but now we're looking at curved motion. The first fact is that the velocity vector of the motion is the derivative of the position vector. The speed of the motion is the norm or the length of the velocity vector, and the distance traveled can be found via integration of the speed function. Here was the example from the last video, and we're just going to continue building on this. The trajectory of a ball or a projectile is modeled by some parametric equations. So you see them here, x, the x-coordinate is a function of time. It equals 30 times t. That's how you find the x-coordinate. And y, the y-coordinate is a function of time as well. It equals this. In other words, the point is a function of time. You can think of it that way, at least. C of t represents the point as a function of time. You put the x and y coordinates together in a point. Distances are measured in meters, meters and time in seconds. And this should make some sense. This 4.9 comes from taking 9.8 meters per second squared and dividing by 2. And I won't get into any more detail besides that. I should also note that this is not taking air resistance into account. We are only thinking about the force of gravity here. All right, so in the last part, we started using Mathematica to create graphs for these par for this parametric curves, uh, as well as graphs for the individual coordinate functions. And we're ultimately going to make graphs of the distance as a function of time and the speed as a function of time using grid to combine all these graphs into one. So we enter the functions down here. You see we've got f of t is 30t, g of t is this, and c of t is put together in a list in Mathematica that's going to represent a point. It's also going to represent a vector, the position vector of the point. When I put the first and second coordinate functions into this list separated by a comma and using curly braces. Initially I'm going to think of it as a point. So here is our manipulate animation from the last video to see what's going on here. The parametric curve itself, in other words the motion itself, the trajectory is over here on the left. You can see that the uh, ball reaches a maximum height of around uh, maybe 18 or 19 or something and it travels horizontally 120 meters, I, these are in meters. This graph over here on the right is not the trajectory even though it still is a parabola. It is the graph of the y coordinate as a function of time. Time goes from 0 to 4. I probably should start this video by labeling these axes although I'm going to do one other thing first. By putting in an aspect ratio option in here, arrow 1, in both cases that's going to make the scales on the vertical axes the same. There we go, and that's nice. So the, you see the scales going up and down are the same, but the scales going horizontally are not. This one down here is x, this one down here is t, and I should label those axes now. Let's add another option, axes label for the graph on the left. Uh, again, x is horizontal, y is vertical. And make the, let's make those bigger. And then for the graph on the right, t is horizontal and y is ver vertical. So now we've got the right labeling. All right, make sure you understand the dis distinction here. These are different graphs, even though they look the same. All right, uh, we could also to plot the x coordinate as a function of time. I can do that within the grid structure. Again, here's the basic syntax of grid. Ultimately, and if I want to make a, a grid with four things, essentially a two by two matrix of plots. Let's do it with a simpler example. If I do something like this, it's going to put these letters in a grid, in a 2x2 two two grid. That's what I want to do with my graphs. This is the syntax. You can notice that I've got the A comma B part right here with these parametric plots. Now I want to put a comma there and put a C comma D part like this. This is the structure. 
in the lower left, I want, want to have the plot of f. So I will copy and paste to help save, save some time here. Copy and paste the plot of g here, change the g to an f, change the uh, y to an x, and then also the plot range, x goes from 0 to 120, so I want to make this 120. All right, that should do it. I'll get rid of this grid. That should do it. Now you see three graphs. The one on the bottom there, that's the x-coordinate as a function of time. That's a linear function, which we already knew. It's the graph of x equals 30t. Linear function with a slope, a rate of change of 30. That's what this straight line is. And it's keeping track of the x-coordinate as a function of time. It is matching horizontally with this graph, but that's um, just a coincidence. In reality, the best thing I should do with this is I should turn it sideways. I should rotate it at a 90 degrees to the right so that the x-coordinate, this axis here, 0 to 120, is truly matching up with the horizontal axis here. Okay, the way to do this, this is always very difficult to do. You have to experiment with the graphics command. And in particular, a subcommand of the graphics command called inset. Notice how I'm doing this. If it's, it probably should be confusing. It's a confusing thing. So I've got inset here gra within the graphics, and inside inset I've got my plot. That's right here. I need some options that will do what I want it to do. We'll position the graph correctly and also rotate it at a 90 degree angle to the right. It turns out through some experimentation that if I put a comma here, then put 2 comma 58 in a list, and then 2 5, comma 58 again in a list, and then comma automatic, then comma 0 comma negative 1 in a list, that as if by magic, now we have a rotation and a good position for the graph on the lower left there. Turn your head sideways to the right by 90 degrees and you see the graph of x as a function of time. Where did I get all these things? This 258, for example, I experimented before I made the video with what should go there. It, it took some experimentation. These are positioning uh, lists. This 0, negative 1 does the rotation and to tell you the truth, I forget offhand what the automatic does, but put it there. Okay, this is the syntax that will create what we just saw. All right, uh, a few more minutes here. We're wanting to get the distance traveled and speed function in there. Let's get the velocity vector first. Now, in past videos, I used the notation r of t to represent the velocity vector. Let me add it here. Here was the notation I used for vectors, first of all. Here was the position vector. It's really c of t, except thought of as a vector instead of a point, and we use a slightly different notation for that, following John Rogoski and what he does. Other teachers do this as well. All right, we also might use a bold face there to indicate that this is a vector. This is the position vector. And I could go ahead and define an r of t here, but essentially I would use the same formula that I used for c of t. So you know, effectively, Mathematica treats C of T and R of T the same. And I can differentiate C of T to get the velocity vector here. And we can see what it is. It's this vector. You get it by differentiating the first coordinate, the first component, to get 30, and the second coordinate or second component to get this. If you know calculus, you should be able to derive that on your own. If you are just in pre-calculus, you're just trusting me. The norm of this vector is going to be the speed. Here's the norm. It's this quantity. I actually don't need the absolute value symbol there in Mathematica here when I am going to define the speed now. Because I'm squaring, and in fact, I'm ultimately going to integrate the speed, and absolute values are difficult to deal with in integration, including for Mathematica sometimes. So I think I'm going to get rid of the absolute value sign and just put a square here. It won't make a difference because I'm squaring it. These things here are just an indicator that there's more decimal places of accuracy. I'll get rid of those. That's my speed function. And I can go ahead and plot that in the lower right corner of the grid. Maybe it's the last thing to do. 
for this video. Let's see. Give it a good plot range. How fast does it go? I'm not sure. Let me take a guess. Well, I know it goes at least 30 meters per second. Probably more. I'll go up to 0 to 50 here initially. All right. In the lower right, we've got a graph of the speed as a function of time. It is slowing down and then speeding up. I'll end this video at this point, and we'll continue in the next video.